Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, How to Improve Energy Efficiency in a Compressed Air System, sponsored by Kaiser Compressors. My name is John Hitch, Senior Editor with New Equipment Digest. Now before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if the slides or audio are not responding, just press the F5 key to refresh your webinar console. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenters, simply type into the Q&A window on the left side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during that Q&A session, which is going to follow this main presentation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on the New Equipment Digest website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your console, the Kaiser logo is hotlinked. If you want to visit their website during the webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open and that won't take you out of the webinar. Now I'd like to welcome our presenters from Kaiser Compressors. Information on each speaker is available on the speaker bio tab in the lower toolbar. Today we'll hear from Grayson Atkinson, System Design Supervisor, Neil Meltreder, Engineering Manager, and Werner Rauer, Rotary Screw Compressors Product Manager. And welcome Neil, we're going to start with you. The floor is yours. Thank you, John, and thanks to everyone else out there joining us for today's webinar, How to Improve Energy Efficiency in a Compressed Air System. As you can see here, the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that half of all compressed air is wasted. Imagine if 50% of your product was scrapped. That would be a huge loss. However, with your compressed air system, this could be happening continuously, and you just don't know it. We've seen countless facilities prove this graphic accurate with the waste occurring in leaks, artificial demand, and inappropriate uses. So let's take a closer look at these wastes and the potential efficiency gains. The word leaks speaks for itself. Nearly every system has leaks, and they can account for a ton of wasted energy. The average is about 25%. Some users, they simply accept leaks as just another operating expense but others, they do nothing about it. In other cases, people take steps and do a leak detection audit, but maybe they don't follow through and fix those leaks. Artificial demand, it's going to refer to waste created when you make air at a higher pressure than you really need. So at higher pressures, your leaks are going to leak more, your tools are going to use more air, your lifetime for those tools are going to uh, degrade pretty quickly as well. Inappropriate uses, those can be any time you're using compressed air when you can use an alternative means to achieve that same effect. Uh, the big example is many employees use compressed air for personal cooling when it would be far more efficient to use fans instead. Efficiency, that's that big pie, 50%. Um, that is where you can improve probably the most, uh, let's say, um, by addressing problem areas within your compressed air system. So um, it's limited. Now, it's, it's including but not limiting to um, insufficient storage, lack of master controller, and any inherent system design efficiency. So you can make your compressed air 100% of that, but what of that is actually efficient? So that's what we're talking about here. In many cases, system design is going to be broken down into a few simple rubrics. Um, number one, more is better. As applied to compressed air system, if I really need only a 100 horsepower compressor, then I'm going to buy a 150 horsepower compressor so I can grow into it. Um, in many cases, system efficiency is not going to be considered. So when plants add point of use equipment, we may know how much compressed air is actually needed, but we may not think about how the new compressed air system is going to interface with that existing system. Also, maybe there's no plan for um, changes in demand. So when plants are built, we usually know how, how much demand they're going to need at the peak, and that's that design point. But that, may, that peak might be 18 months away. It could be 10 years away. We, we may never get there. So to achieve the highest system efficiency through the lifetime of your system and ensure reliability of that system over the course of that lifetime, you must design a system for today's demand as well as any future expectations thus avoid oversizing your system for today. Lastly, uh, lowest first cost. Energy costs are about 70% of the lifetime cost of your compressors, whereas purchasing one large compressor is typically your lowest first cost. It may not be the best choice from an energy efficiency standpoint or really a reliability standpoint. 
if prevalent attitudes can be overcome, there are a number of very effective ways to make improvements. Applying any of these strategies shown here can give you noticeable energy savings. Fixing leaks alone can easily generate uh, energy improvements of between 6 and 10 percent, and really that's a very conservative number. Uh, choosing proper compressor controls and controlling multiple compressors or compressor rooms uh, from one device can also offer significant energy savings and really improved pressure stability, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, reducing pressure drop with good maintenance practices and air treatment selection, that's also going to pay back. Um, again, these are very conservative and realistic numbers for improving system efficiency. And if you can tap into your compressor as a heat source, um, which we'll talk about later as well, you can really even get further ahead. Today we're going to touch on multiple strategies, uh, those listed above, uh, for energy reduction and system reliability uh, improvements. So by applying any of these, uh, you'll have a chance for immediate midterm um, and also ongoing energy savings opportunities. We'll start the energy efficiency discussion with compressed air piping. The type of piping material you have in your system is going to greatly impact the air quality you're going to have now and also in the future. And this can also affect whether your system has leaks over time as well. In the pictures, you see the effect of condensate buildup. Either filters and dryers aren't sized properly or they're not serviced regularly. And I'm sure you can see how this would prevent air from flowing freely. When air is restricted, we call it turbulent flow, and it's obviously something we'd like to avoid. It's really a multi-part problem. Restrictions to flow result in higher pressure drops across pipe networks. And this can result in lower pressures at the point of use, which can affect product quality and scrap rates. Typical pressure, um, typically pressure at a compressor discharge is then going to be increased to overcome that pressure drop, which results in increase in energy consumption. Rule of thumb, 2 PSI increase equals 1% increase in energy. So the higher pressures then cause even higher demands, which we just talked about in regard to artificial demand, and this further increases energy consumption. Plus, this buildup that we're seeing could be passed downstream to the point of use, which could further affect product quality and scrap rates, which obviously we'd like to avoid. This chart gives you an overview of common piping materials and their advantages and disadvantages. Um, it may look a little small on your display, so you know, I apologize for that, but you can download a copy of the presentation and refer to this later on, as well as all the other good information that we'll cover today. I'm not going to read the chart in detail, but I want to caution uh, anyone and everyone about using uh, PVC piping for compressed air. This is something uh, fairly common uh, that you see, you know, really out in the industry because um, it's lightweight and inexpensive. However, it's cause for concern in terms of compressed air and safety. So OSHA's ruled against using it for above ground installations unless it's encased in a shatterproof material. So if you're looking for reliable cost effective piping, um, I would encourage you to consider aluminum or copper. Uh, they're great for installation and you, you're not going to run into trouble with any buildup like you would with some of the other materials. I will say many food and beverage manufacturers specify stainless steel another good option, but as you can see in the disadvantages, it's going to be labor intensive and expensive as well um, to install. So now that we've discussed the materials, let's talk a little bit about the layouts. Starting with a branch or, or line piping system or network, um, which is what you see here in the graphic, the main takeaway here is from the compressor room, compressed air then travels through a main header pipe and then it's going to branch out to those points of use. Keep in mind as you move down the pipe, the longer the run, the more the pressure drop to that point of use. In all systems, pipe runs are really dictated based on the location of your point of use equipment. Simply running the pipe on one wall to those points of use, that can be pretty effective. Uh, note that it's recommended to maintain a 10% or less pressure drop between the compressor generation and the point of use. Uh, therefore, piping can really have a huge effect on meeting that number especially if it's undersized like we're going to see in an example later on. This graphic here, it's a much uh, simpler graphic um, than we saw on the previous slide in regard to the number of point of use, but it serves to show the, the looped or a ring piping network. Uh, many systems can benefit from supporting demands from multiple directions, and this also can significantly reduce the velocity within that piping network, as well as reduce the overall pressure drop throughout the system. Looking at the two types side by side, uh, we can see the advantages and disadvantages fairly quickly. 
But in the end, your facility, the complexity of the air system, those things are going to dictate how the pipe could actually be run. Uh, even if you have a branch system, you can make that into a loop. You know, maybe it's fairly easy to do so by adding uh, a few sticks of pipe. Or maybe you can create loops in certain areas that are um, high demand. It's going to come down to capital cost, installation cost, energy benefits, as well as productivity benefits. You know, what I'd normally see from a productivity savings, those can often significantly outweigh energy savings when it comes to piping benefits. So, you know, look at those things when you're laying out the system so you can get ongoing um, savings potential. It's one of my favorite case studies um, that's going to show uh, visually the effects of piping on an actual system. Uh, so this is data that, that we actually recorded. Um, so note how the, the chart's broken up. On the top, we have pressures um, starting in the red, which is from the compressor discharge. Uh, then after air treatment, which is your dryers and filters, that's the green. And then to the point of use, which is the yellow. So that's at the top. And then at the bottom, we break up flow uh, between zero and about 1,600 CFM uh, based on individual compressors. So the pink is a 250 horsepower compressor, followed by the gold, which is a 40 horsepower compressor. And then we see a little later on um, a green compressor comes on, which is 100, CF, uh, 100 horsepower. Um, in the first section at the far left that we've broken up, uh, you see a period where compressor flow is unable to meet demand. And when that happens, pressure falls. So at the compressor discharge, um, pressure starts to fall below target levels, and then we see all the other pressures follow suit. The difference between the red and the yellow is about 30 pounds. It doesn't necessarily look like it in the graphic, but that's fairly substantial. And if we use our 2 PSI um, equals 1% energy, that's a 15% uh, energy increase there to overcome the pressure drop. In this section in the middle, um, now we see uh, that second or the third compressor come online, which is the green, that 100 horsepower unit, which is cycling up and down. Now pressure is stabilized, so that's a good thing, um, but we're still at a 20 psi drop between the red pressure and the green pressure, which is after air treatment in the compressor room. Um, the point of use is still at about 25 PSI differential, so still really a significant um, pressure differential. Remember when we said a 10 PSI drop or a 10% drop is what we'd expect? Um, we're obviously not able to meet that here. With the third section at the far right, uh, we see a much lower flow, uh, maybe 10% of the peak. All the pressures are pretty much similar, so negligible pressure drop, and that's the key is the, the flow and the piping are what we would expect um, for, for the demand. And when we look at the next graphic, you'll see what I mean. So here's a picture of an actual system. Um, so we had about 1,300 CFM on average uh, on that peak going through a two-inch main header in the compressor room. So that's where your pressure drop mainly is, is in the compressor room. And then when we look at the next picture, we highlight the distribution piping, so also two inch. The majority of pressure drop in that perceived problem or the actual problem is going to occur because the pipe size didn't meet the current demand. And again, that's a 10 to 15 percent energy increase, um, really because from a design standpoint, we started adding equipment in the compressor room versus changing the piping. So, you know, in short, piping plays a significant role in, in how your system is going to perform. And keep in mind that the piping is going to stay in there long probably after the compressors are um, repaired and or replaced. So think about overall how long it's going to take you um, to change that piping, maybe 50 years. Moving on to leaks, you know, now that we've covered piping material, um, again, leaks can cause uh, 25 to 30 percent of your or account for 25 to 30 percent of your overall energy cost. And this impacts your power bill. Um, you know, basically it's going to cause your compressors to cycle, cause you to, um, to increase pressure drop. It's going to drive up your production and maintenance costs. Um, so these are things that, that we would like to avoid. By eliminating leaks in your system, we can add that back. So, um, you know, that's what we're trying to show you here on what those energy savings could be. In general, how much does a hole in your pipe cost? Now, as you can see, one and only one quarter-inch leak in your entire system, you're going to be losing $1,500 a month. 
uh, or equivalently $18,000 per year based on 110 PSI operating pressure and uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you imagine, you know, how many leaks do you really have in this system? Surely more than one. That, that number is going to add up. To calculate your leak costs, you see the, the blue formula down at the bottom, and that's dependent on your specific power. It's a key performance index, and we're going to hit that pretty hard later on when we talk about data analysis. So in, in general, leaks typically are 5 to 10 CFM, which ends up accounting for, at this rate, about $1,500 um, per year each. So again, fixing those leaks can provide an immediate payback. In this example, so we wanted to show you a case study, give you a couple different ways to, to look at this. Um, this soft drink uh, bottling plant was losing about 200 CFM to leaks and non-productive demands, which is that bottom line uh, that you see here. And that was, you know, nights and weekends, uh, off-shift demands. Um, and that ended up resulting in $34,000 per year uh, of wasted energy for this particular customer. Uh, this graphic shows, you know, quantifies to the customer what that, that leak rate could be um, and gives them a real impetus to do a leak study to dial in and find out where those leaks are. So it really shows the power of a compressed air audit, which we'll touch on a little bit later on. The industry standard uh, for leak detection is ultrasonic. Ultrasonic leak detectors, they require specialized equipment and a little bit of training. Uh, you'll see on the image there on the right. But it also gives you a volume level for each leak, so it gives you an estimate on what those, um, the volume is and then what the cost is. Uh, this is going to help you prioritize which leaks to fix first. So, you know, if you can hear it without a leak detector, fix that leak immediately because that's going to cost you a lot of money. When you have a leak audit done, there's a few points to look for. Uh, not all service providers are necessarily the same. You know, make sure that each leak is tagged and clearly identified. You get a report uh, when that, that audit is complete. A good audit is also going to give you estimated cost and savings potential for each leak uh, with pictures of each location. And no, the tag isn't there just to remind you that you have a leak. The tag's there to remind you that it needs to be fixed. After you have the audit completed, um, you want to have a plan in place for repairing those leaks, like I said a moment ago. First, repair any leaks that pose a safety hazard or could cause any kind of system failure or breakdown. That, that's the big item right there. Second, going by an 80-20 rule, fix the largest leaks first. Third, the next largest leaks. These are still going to account for significant losses, but they're not part of that top 20%. And fourth, those small leaks. What do, what do you do? Well, monitor these, these minor leaks and repair them if they actually get worse. Finally, keep in mind, when it comes to leak detection, it's never going to be a one-and-done type scenario. Um, make leak detection part of your annual maintenance. Um, and depending on the size of your facility, maybe you want to do it quarterly. It just depends. You know, as, as we talked about just now, it's going to represent one of the largest energy wasters in your compressed air system. Now I'm going to hand it off to Grayson to continue our energy efficiency improvement discussion. Thank you, Neil. So first up, let's talk about why to do a compressed air audit. Uh, many system owners don't have a clear picture of how their system operates and they don't have any idea how much energy it consumes. Compressed air audits are a great way to baseline the system and visualize what's happening before trying to make improvements or add compressors to accommodate expansions. Knowing how much energy you use to compress air should be a primary goal. An audit will do this and help you identify what's driving the cost of your compressed air, such as leaks and other unproductive uses. The data collected can also be used to determine the optimal mix of compressed air equipment for the existing need or for future expansions. An air audit from a competent compressed air professional is the first step in determining compressed air efficiency and combining this audit with a leak detection service and an evaluation of each compressed air user will improve overall system performance. An audit can help you build an energy and demand profile to help you see in black and white what your system capacity is and what your production demands are. Let's take a look at an actual air audit chart and see what it helped the customer identify about his system. And that's this chart here. 
First, we can see the maximum plant demand, in this case, was about 380 CFM, and that occurs once around mid-morning on day four. This is the highest amount of air required by the system during the test period. What's interesting to see is that during the production time, the flow profile varies quite a bit. There's not a consistent requirement for the same amount of air over the duration of the entire test. Now for reference, we'll show the total capacity of the compressor and the available capacity that isn't being used. This tells us that the compressor is actually oversized. There could be significant energy savings by switching to a combination of smaller compressors, which use considerably less energy and still produce the volume of air needed to meet the demands of the system. A good audit will also provide clues to non-productive loads, like leaks or timed electric drain traps. Non-productive loads can waste energy 24-7 if the compressors are on. In this particular case, the customer noted that a lot of air was being consumed after hours and on weekends when he was not in production. Approximately 170 CFM, or half of the productive load, was simply being wasted. This is the equivalent of running a 40 horsepower compressor full time. This customer was spending over $20,000 in electricity with no benefit, not to mention additional costs of maintenance on the compressor. This is not uncommon and occurs in much larger systems as well. To sum up, the key conclusions we can draw from this one chart are, one, the existing compressor was severely oversized, with the peak flow recorded during the test being only 50% of the compressor's capacity. Number two, of the 380 CFM peak flow, over half of that was wasted non-productive load. And third and finally, reducing the non-productive load and correctly sizing a replacement compressor for the production demand alone has the potential to greatly reduce energy costs and provide significant gains in reliability and compressor longevity. Using air audits on a regular basis can help you make sure your compressed air system is always running at its best. As we'll see later, data monitoring from a master controller can provide a powerful tool to ensure system efficiency. So this is a typical system that we would see, and knowing this information can really help you understand your system and give you an idea of how to best optimize it. We haven't considered the type of control here or whether there's sufficient system storage. So while we have identified that the compressor is oversized and that the non-productive demand represents a significant portion of the compressed air that the system is supplying, we don't know how efficiently the compressed air system is actually running. An audit will tell you this based on a key performance indicator called specific power. So let's do a real quick polling question. Uh, how many of you know what the duty cycle of your compressors are or what the specific power is in your system? Okay, so not many. It looks like uh, about 10% of you guys do and 90% and don't. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about is it's really important to know these because not only can it help you run your system more efficiently, but it also saves you a lot of money on your bottom line. So specific power explains how efficiently the compressed air system is operating, but it doesn't necessarily explain how effective the system is. So as we discussed before, 50% of the compressed air supplied could be wasted energy. Specific power only explains whether it's efficiently generated or not. Using the Compressed Air and Gas Institute, or KGI, data sheets, you can see what the efficiency is for fixed-speed compressors operating both at full load, which is when they're making 100% of flow at their full load pressure, or when they're idling, which is when they're making zero flow with the motor still running. There are really two facets that affect specific power. The duty cycle of the compressors that you have, which is the ratio of the loaded time to the overall service time, and with fixed speed compressors, whether they're running at full load, the most efficient point of operation, or if they're off. Variable frequency driven compressors are most efficient between 40 and 85% of full load. We'll talk more later about how these all work together in our control section. In the end, operating pressures also have significant effect on system performance, with higher pressures having an overall higher energy consumption. 
The screenshot above is taken from a master controller which collects operational data from the compressors it controls. One of these data points is the load versus idle time of each compressor. Taking a look at compressor 1 in the screenshot above, we can see that over the selected 24-hour interval, the compressor used approximately 442 kilowatt hours for on-load operation where the compressor was making air. Over the same interval, compressor 1 used about 8 kilowatt hours while idling. If we create a ratio of these two numbers, we can see that the duty cycle for compressor 1 was approximately 98%, meaning that 98% of the time the compressor was running, it was running fully loaded. This is an excellent duty cycle for a load-unload compressor. The other duty cycles can be calculated using the same method, and you can see that they're all above 90%. This is one of the major benefits of having properly sized compressors and an effective master controller. The system is not only able to provide sufficient flow and maintain operating pressure, but does so in the most efficient and reliable manner possible. So the overall goal of our talk today is to provide some food for thought <clears throat> regarding how facilities can capitalize on energy efficiency and improve reliability. Operating pressure clearly affects the specific power we just talked about. We've mentioned a rule of thumb for compressed air that for every two PSI increase in pressure, this corresponds to a 1% increase in energy consumption of the compressors. Plus, any increase in pressure also increases the demand. Calling back to the concept of artificial demand, a 1% reduction in pressure represents a 1% reduction in demand. So clearly, we want to reduce operating pressure as low as possible to start with. In Neil's section, we talked about the piping network and how the right size and design can minimize pressure drop. Anytime you have higher pressure in the compressor room than in the facility, you need to determine the degree of the difference between the two values. If it's a significant difference, you need to find out why. Is it the piping? Is it the air treatment? Is there a restriction? It's important to not only identify that there is a difference, but to see what's causing it. Higher station pressure results in higher energy consumption, like we just discussed, but also results in higher maintenance costs as well, since we're running the equipment closer to its maximum design point. With higher pressure drop across air treatment, the effective pressure band for the compressors is much smaller and can result in rapid compressor cycling. Anytime you have multiple compressors cycling or running at part load, your specific power will increase, making your system less efficient, increasing maintenance costs, and potentially affecting system reliability. Further pressure variance at the point of use can affect productivity and scrap rates. So how do you know what pressure to set your compressors at? you got to ask. When you ask five different people in a facility what pressure they need, you'll probably get five different answers, from the plant manager to the maintenance supervisor to the person working at the end of the line. All of these people may have valid arguments, and perhaps all of them are correct. As we saw in Neil's previous example, pressure drop in the facility will vary based on supply flow. The lower the flow, the lower the pressure drop. Typically, flows vary throughout the day, and therefore, so will pressure drop. After you've determined the proper pressure, define it. Establish design points for each item in your compressed air system. The table shown gives some examples of reasonable pressure drops in your system. Reduce all possible choke points in your system, whether they're in the compressor room or piping, and confirm that they're within factory recommendations. If not, consider servicing these items. Remember that across your system, a good estimate is a 10% drop from the compressors to the point of use. Piping size, material, and configuration, whether it's looped or branch, will ultimately affect this pressure drop. If you can address system restrictions, reducing the pressure 1 to 2 PSI per week is a reasonable goal. Find the point where supply meets demand. Remember that the lower the pressure you run, the more energy savings you'll have, and the more efficiently you'll be running the system. This can have ongoing savings for any system. Let's talk a little about compressor design parameters. Specifically oversizing, which Neil already mentioned earlier on. Oversizing can also lead to air quality problems. If the compressors are so oversized, they never come up to operating temperature, and there's a good chance you'll have problems with moisture. In many cases, a customer purchases a larger compressor in order to future-proof the installation, but ultimately, the compressor remains oversized and sometimes grossly oversized for its entire lifetime. This not only costs more to operate from an energy cost perspective, 
but can also lead to maintenance and reliability issues later on down the line. Additionally, be careful with equipment that's inherited from a sister plant or something that you buy used at an auction. In addition to not necessarily knowing the condition of the equipment, you really want to make sure you have a compressor that's correctly sized for your needs specifically. And finally, remember that plant demands frequently change over time, so you'll want to continually monitor it to see if you need to make some adjustments. Building systems in a block concept can make any facility stronger and more reliable. If your system is oversized, you'll notice extended periods of time where the compressors are unloaded. You can compare the duty cycle of the unit to determine how oversized it really is. While it may seem expensive to purchase new, smaller equipment for an oversized system, the ROI in these cases is typically less than 30 months. You can work with a compressed air manufacturer to run a simulation of your system and get a clear picture of what the ROI would be for your specific case. As noted here, an oversized unit that's only using 30% of its capacity uses 80% more energy than one that's properly sized running fully loaded. And all of this is to meet the exact same demands. The data on this slide was taken from a random sampling of stations that we monitored via compressed air audits. The average duty cycle of our sample was less than 50%. This is probably the worst way to run a fixed speed rotary screw compressor from an efficiency standpoint. Digging deeper into the data, it also affected station reliability as those compressors that had above a 60% duty cycle were significantly more reliable. They had a 50% greater mean time before failure, which accounts for unexpected shutdowns. Considering that the average cost of downtime for manufacturers is $30,000 per hour, such an extension is a significant productivity improvement and can provide an ongoing and immediate cost offset. Keep in mind that if the cost of downtime is high, purchasing backup compressors could provide a very quick payback, typically an even better ROI than the block concept we saw in the previous slide. To check if your compressor is oversized, you can run it in dual control and time load-unload cycles. If the time it's loaded is less than 30% of the entire cycle, you have significant savings potential by switching to a smaller unit. You may also notice many of the other pressure indicators that we mentioned before, like varying pressure and short cycling. Take action and you'll have less headaches going forward. Now I'll hand it over to Werner Rauer and we continue our energy efficiency discussion with compressor controls and heat recovery. Thank you very much, Grayson. Continuing on, we will focus on what the two types of controls are in a compressed air system and their main functions. It's like the pilot in an airplane taking care of things up there while the control tower monitors and provides guidance and directions. The individual or compressor control provides safe local operation by monitoring and controlling all relevant signals and components of the compressor. Most modern compressor controllers also keep track of maintenance information, either by hours or, for example, by temperatures or differential pressures or cycles. They typically also keep historical records with date and timestamps. Depending on the compressor type, there may also be various options on how to control the compressor, like, for example, start-stop, load-unload, or if equipped, with variable speed or variable displacement or modulation control. These controllers are using the discharge pressure right at the compressor as the basis for their control actions. Some also allow for remote pressure sensors to be incorporated as to reduce the cycling and the maximum pressure when clean air treatment is used to control the unit based on the system pressure downstream rather than the compressor discharge. System controllers come into place if you're dealing with two or more compressors in one system. One key aspect is the monitoring of the entire compressor station or even the entire compressed air system. That might include filters, dryers, valves, and local and remote sensors. We'll pick here the variable speed drive for uh, an example. Uh, the start, stop, and load, unload are very simple and very well known. The variable speed or variable frequency drive, also called VFD compressors, are now more popular than ever in industrial plants. 
This type of control varies the frequency of input electricity to the motor, which in turn varies the output flow of the compressor. This is ideal for systems with varying air demand since they can match flow to demand while maintaining a pretty constant operating pressure. However, VFD compressors have drive losses that must be factored in, typically 2 to 5 percent, shown in the graph there in red. Combining that with the performance curve of the actual compressor block, shown on the top right as the block efficiency curve, and you will see that loses efficiency at low and high speed, uh, meaning the long end to the right uh, and then the short one at the top. You will find that most are efficient between 40 and 85 percent, as Grayson mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's the flow range. This means they should only be applied for applications with that variable demand in those borders. They also have a limited control range overall that is only about 50 to 75 percent of the total flow, not 100 percent. That again supports starting with an air audit prior to designing a new compressed air system. When integrating VFD compressors, and yes, you can have multiple in one system, into a master control system, that controller should be capable to store and use the entire operating profile of such a VFD compressor to make sure that they are applied most efficiently and effectively. As mentioned, variable speed compressors have a limited control range, and operating outside of that will create what we call a control gap, where the compressor will cycle or use start-stop mode that is affecting the system pressure and the overall efficiency. In multi-compressor systems, a master controller would apply the active control range of the variable frequency drive, which is the yellow area shown in the graph, along with the available baseload compressors, which are the gray areas. And that will avoid control gaps in the system by choosing the right combinations, but that also means the compressors must be sized properly by system design for the controller to have them available. Doing so will keep the system pressure and efficiency as stable as possible. Most older industrial plants grew into having multiple compressors supplying the flow and or backup for redundancy. In many of these plants, the compressors are spread out throughout the facility with no communication between them, resulting in a constant tug of war. More units will run the necessary at too high of a pressure. We have seen this many, many times. And some of the compressors will actually short cycle. This results in unstable system pressure, higher energy cost, and increased maintenance cost. A system master control is responsible for the entire system. Much like the conductor of an orchestra, it makes sure that each and every component is working well and as intended to meet the current system demand. Its ultimate goal is to achieve the best possible efficiency at all times. Both types of controls are important for the optimization of your plant efficiency. A system controller relies on the information from the individual controllers for, to best optimize the entire system. Individual controllers cannot communicate with one another without a system master controller. This chart here shows the typical operation of a master controller. Compressors are on the left. Any kind of clean air treatment would be in between the compressors and the storage tank on the very right. Sensing the system pressure there for the master controller ensures the lowest system operating pressure. By monitoring changes in that system pressure, the master controller is able to select a control scheme for the compressors to meet the current system demand. It separates the individual controls from the demand and determines how should they run in order to maintain a stable pressure above the minimum required pressure. Notice that in this graph that the compressors A, B, and C are all different sizes, 
with compressor C including a variable frequency drive. System design should be completed based on an air audit when available as Grayson mentioned earlier. In this way, the selection of the compressors can be made based on the prevailing flow profile as well as any expected increase or decreases thereof. We're using this slide here just to show the history of development on pressure-based master controllers. Uh, on the left, from the initial cascade via the pressure band or internal cascade, the blue one, all the way over to a set point base control with the inner and outer bands, which is the green, and finally to the adaptive pressure regulations, which we will get into on the next slide. This chart shows the difference between a system controller with fixed pressure bands and a system controller using the adaptive control. With the pressure band control, there are fixed pressure ranges programmed, and once the pressure falls below this range, the controller will bring on another compressor and may activate timers. So there may be a considerable lag before the next compressor can come online, and pressure may continue to fall. Depending on the number of compressors in the system and how they are sequenced, it's possible that multiple compressors could be brought online almost at the same time. With adaptive control, the system is continually monitored and the controller is continually learning the system and is ultimately able to predict when system pressure may fall and bring a specific additional compressor online in advance, preventing a deep pressure drop as it knows when compressors are online, running loaded or unloaded, and the time needed to bring offline compressors into the solution. It may also consider system storage, for example, the re receiver tank volume, in its uh, solution. That type of control can only work efficiently because it knows at any time that all the data and parameters of all the compressors and pertinent components that are integrated into the system by having a digital twin or replication in memory of those components. Based on current and past events, this control decides based on algorithms and calculations with predictions into the future what needs to be done for efficient and reliable operation. It's like playing a game of chess on your computer where the computer opponent goes through all possible scenarios to pick its choice. It knows that the most efficient way to operate a system is to only have base load units fully loaded or off and operating trim load scenarios based on the available trim load compressors, control mode, and efficiencies. Quick repeat. A compressed air system's demand is rarely consistent. Demand fluctuates constantly opening the door for system pressure to swing and for efficiency gaps. A master controller adapts to these changes in demand in three ways. First, it monitors the rate of change in pressure so it can give a more rapid and accurate response. Second, it predicts when to turn an additional compressor on to minimize pressure drop. And third, it learns and adapts to patterns of system behavior. This minimizes idling and pressure swings and improves system efficiency. So what kind of savings can we expect by having a system master controller? With such a controller, you will have reduced run and idle time. You will only be running the units you need, and the starts and switching losses will be reduced. This can give savings anywhere from 2 to 10%, as Neil showed earlier. Additionally, it will improve pressure performance because it quickly recognizes pressure changes and maintains stable pressure control. This can provide even more savings, up to 10%. Maintaining stable pressure is important for most facilities. However, trying to maintain a tight pressure band can also result in short-cycling your compressors, which inadvertently increases your operating costs. Therefore, during periods of low demand, an adaptive control may increase the overall pressure band to ensure not only proper cycling of your compressors, but also achieve higher energy savings. And finally, system master controller can reduce artificial demand. 
Artificial demand is any time you run your system at a higher pressure than necessary. If savings will vary per system, I'm sorry, the savings will vary per system, but keep in mind that you can have 1% savings for each 2% in pressure reduction. Some additional benefits nowadays include remote monitoring capabilities. Keep in mind that most industrial plants have more than one compressor supplying the flow, making a system master controller an important part of their energy management strategy. Some advanced controllers have data storage capabilities and can track and calculate specific energy consumption. Some even support the ISO 50001 energy management reporting requirements. Grayson and Neil both mentioned air and leak audits. Those can now be done easily and on an ongoing basis using the logged data and automated reports, or you can download the data to create your own. Additionally, remote monitoring capabilities mean system information can be accessed from anywhere at any time. Technicians can view diagnostic codes before performing service to cut down on troubleshooting time and show up with the correct parts overall saving time. Some of these features add also quite a bit to, uh, to the reliability of the operation of your compressed air system. So we cannot talk really about efficiency savings in compressed air systems without at least mentioning heat recovery. Real quick, 100% of the electrical energy consumed is converted into heat. 2% of the balance remains in the compressed air as heat, and another 2% radiates from the compressor package into the immediate surroundings. That leaves us, ideally, 96% that can be recovered as heat coming off the coolers and the motor efficiencies. For an air-cooled machine, that would mean that the cooling airflow can be ducted away using that heat for heating up rooms, including the compressor room during the cold winter months. However, those applications are only useful during those colder months. This comparison shows where the energy comes from for producing hot water on an air-cooled, all flooded compressor on the left, and an all-free water-cooled compressor on the right. For water-cooled compressors, the maximum is nearly the same at 96%. However, the obtainable actual water temperatures are higher for the water-cooled all free compressors with up to 195 degrees. For the air-cooled fluid injected type, up to 76% can be recovered from the hot cooling fluid. On the left, we show a shell and tube type heat exchanger tapping into the hot cooling fluid in that picture. Uh, on all free compressors, the heat of compression can be used can be used for regenerating a desiccant dryer, typically called a HOC or heat of compression dryer. Some of them are also available as built in to the compressor. So applications for that heat. Most of the time, this heat is simply ejected in the ambient environment throughout the compressor cooling system and wasted. As we mentioned, nearly all this thermal energy can be recovered and put to useful work and significantly lower facilities energy costs. Here are some of the many applications, uh, makeup air, preheating boiling water, heating process fluids, and so on. And I uh, want to go to the next one. I apologize also for the small print, but you will have this in your presentation. Um, for the return of investment calculations, the actual energy type and costs currently being used for generating heat is very important. A lot of times people just talk about the possible savings of electricity in terms of operating the compressor, but do not calculate the true cost savings for the actual planned application. As a side note, the list at the top left is in order of energy cost, with electricity being the highest and natural gas or coal the lowest. As they say, your mileage may vary, but this example is on the conservative side. This example shows a system with several air-cooled, all-flooded compressors with optional heat recovery. 
where the oil circuit has a heat exchanger to produce hot water. Those insulated water lines are shown on the right-hand side in the blue frame along with the pumps, valves, and controls. The hot water generated here as a byproduct of compressed air is being used to heat up dipping baths for cleaning sheet metal prior to powder coating. This installation is actually located in one of our Kaser manufacturing plants. This type of heat recovery is a very popular option in Europe where the energy costs are very high, more than twice what they're here, as well as in newly planned system here in the United States. Retrofits are done rarely as the infrastructure is not in place and implementation is more costly, so plan ahead. And here finally are some links to additional compressed air resources, including white papers, information on compressed air audits, leak detection, as well as our company blogs. Thank you very much for your attention. And now, with the amount of time left, I believe we are ready to take some questions. Thanks so much, Werner, and thanks to Grayson and Neil as well. Uh, so a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. While our presenters are answering your questions, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that appears on the left side of your screen. So the first question is, how often should I do a leak detection, and can I do it myself, or should I hire someone else? Yeah, John, uh, thanks for the question. Good question. Uh, this is Neil again. Um, <clears throat> you know, it depends on how big of a system you have. Um, you know, we occasionally get a call and say, oh, you know, I, I have a, a need for either an air audit or a leak audit. And we say, okay, well, let's see if it's cost effective. You know, having somebody come out and, and do the audit uh, is going to cost you some money, but the, the idea is, <coughs> excuse me, what's the benefit? You know, if it costs you $1,200 to have somebody come out, you want to be able to save that kind of money. So if you have a 10 horsepower compressor, probably having a leak audit doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If your system is 1,000 horsepower, then definitely makes sense for you to have a, a, a compressed air leak detection audit done. Um, if you have a large facility, maybe you do that quarterly. Um, if you have a medium-sized facility, uh, I would suggest to do that annually. So um, it kind of leads into probably other questions we have, but you know, do you know what, what your, uh, your percentage of leaks is? If it's relatively high, then you definitely want to have it more often than not. Good question. Thanks, John. No problem. Uh, so the next question uh, is, what is the best way to start with optimizing my compressed air system? Hey, so this is Grayson. Um, in my mind, the best way would be with some sort of uh, compressed air audit or energy audit. Uh, in order to improve your system, you need to know what you're spending money on, how much you're spending, how much air you need, what your pressure requirements are. And doing an energy audit is really the best way to tick all of those boxes before you get started and figure out where you want to direct your money, where you want to direct your time into improving the system. It's a, it's a great way to baseline what you're spending now and to come up with how much money you can save and to calculate an ROI on any of the improvements that you are planning on making. So really defining what you're doing now and defining where you're heading in the future um, via an energy audit, in, in my mind, is the best way to get started on improving the system. All right, thanks. Uh, the next question is from someone that doesn't believe that they heard much about compressed air storage tanks. Uh, they want to know uh, how they help and what size is now recommended. Oh, that's a fantastic question. This is Werner. Uh, believe it or not, this is probably the most difficult part of selling to an end user because for them it's a dead space sitting somewhere in the corner and taking away room from their production. Uh, we have, of course, numerous white papers and articles about it. Uh, since you asked for the what type of recommendation, uh, it ranges typically you want to have some kind of control buffer, one to two gallons per CFM, and then a dry storage, which is anywhere from four to five. There are some people who say up to 10. It all depends, as uh, uh, Grayson said, once you do the air audit and then you design your system, you typically focus on, like the master controller, on your cycling compressors. Suddenly, that huge amount, uh, because you normally count all compressors, it's reduced because you're actually cycling one or two machines, which is part of your solution, so those requirements may come down. Overall, though, bottom line, the bigger, the better, 
There's nothing wrong about this. Uh, it's just a matter of how much can I squeeze into the corner in my plan. But I repeat, anywhere from four to five uh, gallons per CFM is a minimum. Once you go into system design, then you look uh, with a master controller, you look at your cycling compressors, and then uh, it may be changing a little bit if you look at the recommendation for the entire system. All right, thanks, Werner. Uh, this next one is pretty detailed. Uh, so um, can you please explain for normal pressures and flows and when uh, the compressor design is okay, um, what the uh, normal efficiency, such as the isentropic efficiency, uh, should be um, with the different uh, compressor technologies? Okay, this is Werner. The isentropic efficiency, when you calculate it, which is basically just, uh, you can use the specific power of a compressor and easily calculate this. However, this is exactly the point here, that when you have different technologies, for example, let's talk about an all-flooded uh, rotary screw compressor. We're talking here, depending on the size, anywhere from 60 to 85% of an isotropic efficiency. As soon as you switch over to uh, uh, all free machines, then you're looking at what type of designs, how many stages do you have, water-cooled or air-cooled, and that then comes up with uh, efficiencies, isentropic efficiencies that are basically pressure unrelated because it's always compared to a theoret theoretical case, and they then may be very even more than that. So the isentropic efficiency, uh, let's say for the same horsepower machine, will actually tell you on which one of those compressor uh, types is more efficient in terms of comparing it to the theoretical power required. I hope this helps. There's also some uh, information on the Department of Energy side when they did the energy efficiency standard about a year or two ago. Uh, and if not, uh, give us a shout and we will uh, get into some more details. Great, and we have time for one more question here. Uh, so uh, can you just go over some of the uh, benefits and uh, added values of a pressure control valve? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. This is Neil again. Um, you know, we, we didn't really get into it much, but we did talk about uh, pressure stability and uh, a pressure control valve, or what we typically call here a flow control valve. Um, that would definitely do that. Um, the idea is that what, what's, the, what's the lowest pressure you can operate the facility at? And uh, Grayson uh, keyed in on this earlier. If you ask five different people in the plant, you'll probably get five different answers. But the idea behind uh, a pressure flow controller or just a flow controller would be to try to reduce the pressure to the entire plant to the lowest possible level. What that's going to do is it's going to reduce all the artificial demands out there. So your leaks are going to leak less, um, your, your tools are going to use less air, and so on. So there's pretty much significant savings that's possible. Um, what, what Werner talked about with multiple compressors and master controllers, you can necessarily do a lot of similar things by reducing operating pressure to that lowest point. Um, but what a flow control valve is going to do is for your large air users or your, your heavy uh, system demands, when there's big fluctuations in flow, if you have large storage volumes, so uh, uh, Werner also talked about that in his question about uh, air receivers, you have large storage receivers and a pressure flow controller what you can do is, in effect, try to keep machines off for as long as possible because there's you know, obviously two charges. Number one is the energy cost to run the compressor. Number two is the demand charge. So um, if you have heavy swings in demand and you have to bring on one, two, or three additional machines, your demand charges are going to spike. So if you have the flow controller there and you have a large storage volume, you can mitigate that. Uh, pretty well. Werner has something to add. Yeah, I just want to make sure that nobody forgets that uh, with this uh, uh, pressure regulator you have storage upstream, but that storage is the volume of the receiver tank times the pressure differential. And what a lot of people overlook is that this pressure differential costs you money because you're going to operate pretty much your entire compressed air station at a higher pressure. Uh, even though the system benefits from the lower one. So it's an up and down thing. Again, it's a system design thing. We use it as a tool, but uh, I wouldn't say that it's a panacea and recommend it for every system. All right. Excellent job, guys. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. And uh, unfortunately, now we are out of time. So again, I'd like to thank Grayson Atkinson, Neil Meltrutter, and Vernon Rohr, and our sponsor, Kaiser Compressors. Kaiser Compressor, sorry. And as a reminder, if you are registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. On behalf of New Equipment Digest, have a productive remainder of the day.